Religious liberty is certainly very important for Seventh-day Adventists. We have a prophetic understanding that tells us that religious liberty, practically speaking, will one day be restricted even in the United States. But prophetically, we understand that God's effort to explain himself to the world is going to be restricted by coercive religious laws. Every year, the North American Division of the Seventh-day Adventist Church designates a religious liberty Sabbath, January 28 for 2012. And as part of that emphasis, the world president of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, Elder Ted Wilson, has agreed to preach a religious liberty sermon to underscore the importance of this foundational concept of Adventism. The scene as told in chapter 18 of the Gospel of John is spare and to the point. Jesus had been taken in the Garden of Gethsemane by an armed mob. He'd been dragged before a rather irregular court of the religious authorities. Now they brought him to the Praetorium, the quarters of the occupying Roman soldiers and of Pilate, the governor. The religious leaders would not enter with the prisoner. They sent him in with their complaints. Judge him by your law, they urged. It was not a law that they and most of their countrymen respected, but they wanted it to condemn the man they had come to hate. Pilate sized up the man before him. Are you the king of the Jews, he asked. It was a conclusion not warranted by the situation and the man's condition. He may have heard something to that effect from soldiers monitoring the many public gatherings where Jesus taught. The question was most likely a response to his wife's dream that he was to spare this innocent man. Jesus' reply was apparently dismissive, but actually searching. Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you? Pilate picked up on the implication that he might be recognizing a spiritual authority, as those Jews who read the scriptures should have. Am I a Jew, he shot back? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Now, it's not possible for his use of words to be read as a recognition of the spiritual heritage that defined a Jew then, and to hear him making a distinction between that identity and those people who, with secular mindset, allowed a few of the chief priests to seize the popular teacher who threatened their cherished authority. Jesus' reply put everything into perspective. My kingship is not of this world, he explained. If my kingship were of this world, my servants would fight. But my kingship is not from this world. Three times repeated this emphasis, and it is enough. His kingdom was a, of a higher order. Pilate now had to reconcile an awareness of who the prisoner really was with the pressing complications of his loyalty to Caesar and the need to govern in Rome's interest. Now, in the years since then, many have taken up the name of Jesus and the cause of the kingdom. Many have remembered the example of their Lord and his reminder that the kingdom of God and the kingdoms of man are never to be confused. Far too many through the years have taken up the sword of Peter, the sword that at Jesus' rebuke fell forgotten to the night ground at Gethsemane. The years since have seen many wars of religion, many violent acts in the name of truth, but all a denial of the kingdom. The years since have seen millions tortured and martyred for their faith, sometimes at the hands of those who imagined that they were advancing the kingdom. Too many have chosen to disregard the words of the king before the civil power. Many Christians in the United States see their republic as a Christian one. They might mean well, but they are forgetful of two things. Firstly, those wise men, many of great Christian faith and some of a more secular bent, who set in place the structure of a then new republic, did so with the full intention of separating church and state. They thought so well of religion that they wished to avoid entangling it with the state, as had long been done in the old world. Secondly, 
Too many today have confused the kingdom of God with the kingdom of man. Revelation chapter 13 gives a stark end-time picture of where this sort of confusion ends up. It is the province of a satanic beast power and compulsory worship. Some may be impatient with any suggestion that we are moving close to the end of prophetic time. By the way, I choose the words carefully because the Bible never narrowly predicts the end of the world. It predicts a time for the end of the sin problem and a beginning of an eternity for those loyal to God to live on a renewed earth. But there are those who look askance at any suggestion we might have at the approach of the climax of the great controversy, as pioneer Adventist leader and author Ellen White characterized it. Such people have chosen to separate the myriad signs that the present world order is failing on many fronts. Such people ignore the plainest of Bible prophecy that points to our day, our world order, as the last before the great and terrible day of the Lord, as Malachi chapter 4, verse 5 puts it. Early Seventh-day Adventists made much reference to the prophecies of Daniel. In particular, they used an outline of world empires given in Daniel chapter 2 to mark ours as the final era. They were not the first to do so. The prophecy is so particular and taken together with another vision that can be shown in Daniel chapter 7 that we can then identify five world orders, including the present one. Beyond that, is the stone cut out without man's hand, which brings in the eternal kingdom of God. Back in the religious civil war that engulfed England in the mid-1600s, factions of Puritans saw in the image of Daniel chapter 2 reason to think that they were preparing the way for the coming kingdom. These fifth monarchy men, as they were known, were of course wrong and wrong not least because they imagined that by force of arms they were bringing in the kingdom. The result was a short-lived religious dictatorship, not by swords loud clashing, but by deeds of love and mercy is how a well-known hymn puts it. Who was this Daniel who lived so long ago in Babylon, and just where is Babylon? Actually, we may have seen remnants of once great Babylon on our television screens in recent years as Western forces overran Iraq. The ruins of Babylon are about 60 miles south of Baghdad in an area that saw heavy fighting. Babylon has been in ruins for centuries. Saddam Hussein once imagined himself the restorer of the Chaldean majesty. He began to rebuild with stones engraved with his name alongside stones that extolled Nebuchadnezzar, the great king who conquered Jerusalem, and took Daniel and many others into a long captivity. Today, the ruins are more complete and enveloped in depleted uranium-poisoned dust. The prediction of the prophet Jeremiah that Babylon would never be rebuilt is surer than ever. But back six centuries before Christ, the city was the wonder of the world, wondered at for its hanging gardens and for the military might of the empire ruled by Nebuchadnezzar. No wonder the king came out on the roof of his royal palace and said, as recorded in Daniel chapter 4, verse 30, Is not this great Babylon which I have built by my mighty power? No wonder that the Lord sent him out as a deranged beast into the fields until reason returned and he could acknowledge a higher king. But we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. Daniel was a young captive taken to the king's palace to learn statecraft and no doubt act as a hostage against any further insurrection in Israel. We read about Daniel's resolve to remain faithful it brings to mind the song, Dare to be a Daniel, that many of us sang as children. 
dare to be a Daniel, dare to stand alone, dare to have a purpose firm, dare to make it known. After an initial test over food and the likely fact that the king's food was dedicated to pagan idols, Daniel took his place with the wise or educated men of the kingdom. Then in the second year of his reign, the king had a dream that troubled him, even though he couldn't remember it. He asked the wise men for its meaning. Of course, they had no way to answer the unknown dream, and in a fit of despotic frustration, the king ordered all the wise men to be killed, and that included Daniel himself. Coolly, Daniel begged a little time from the military leader who came to put him to death. Likely, he said he would tell the meaning of the dream on the morrow. He clearly had faith in God to intervene. Then Daniel and his three friends prayed earnestly to God for mercy. It was followed by a dream and its meaning. Significantly, Daniel's prayer of thanks, as recorded in Daniel chapter 2, verses 20 and 21, contains these lines. Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. Later in chapter 7, verse 25, an angel messenger uses a similar turn of phrase to describe the pretensions of an evil persecuting power that is to dominate just before the everlasting kingdom of God. That power, begin quote, shall speak words against the Most High and shall think to change times and laws. Now Daniel comes before the king with the interpretation of the dream. He must have been calm in the knowledge that God was in this thing. It was not really a test of Daniel, but as he tells the king, God speaking to the king the very thoughts of his mind. For us today, those of us living in the times Daniel was shown so clearly so many centuries ago, there is that same likelihood that we may have to give an account before authorities, the kings of this age. How do we prepare? Must it differ in any way from Daniel's time? Ellen White wrote perceptively on this in the year 1900 recorded on pages 40 and 41 of Councils on Sabbath School Work. The servants of Christ, she advised, are to prepare no set speech to present when brought to trial for their faith. Their preparation is to be made day by day in treasuring up in their hearts the precious truths of God's Word, in feeding upon the teaching of Christ, and through prayer strengthening their faith. Then, when brought into trial, the Holy Spirit will bring to their remembrance the very truths that will reach the hearts of those who shall come to hear. God will flash the knowledge obtained by diligent searching of the Scriptures into their memory at the very time when it is needed. How comforting, and yet how very sobering. God will bring to mind the words to say, but only if we have re rehearsed them and reviewed them in days of faithfulness. For Daniel and his friends, the crisis of the moment could not have been more severe. They were under death decree. They had no reason to doubt that a king who held the life of all as his at any time would hesitate to follow through with the kill order. There have been other times like that since. Many of God's faithful have gone to their deaths rather than betray the trust of heaven. And many times God has shown himself in a marked deliverance. For us who may be living at a last great crisis, there will again be a death decree. Our faith will be severely tested, and God will at the end reveal His saving power at the midnight hour. Again, writing on this theme, Ellen White, in a Review and Herald article of June 15, 1897, reminds that from time to time, the Lord has made known His manner of working. 
He is mindful of what is passing upon the earth. And when a crisis has come, he has revealed himself and interposed to hinder the working of Satan's plans. He has often permitted matters with nations, with families, and with individuals to come to a crisis that his interference might become marked. Then he has let the fact be known that there was a God in Israel who would sustain and vindicate his people. When the defiance of the law of Jehovah shall be almost universal, when his people shall be pressed in affliction by their fellow men, God will interpose. The fervent prayers of his people will be answered, for he loves to have his people seek him with all their heart and depend upon him as their deliverer. King Nebuchadnezzar was given many signs that God is the watcher over the affairs of nation, nations and that there is only one king of kings. After the meaning of the dream was told to him by Daniel, the king fell on his face and said, Truly your God is God of gods and Lord of kings. Then he thought to build a 60 cubit high image like that he saw in the dream and require all the leading men of the kingdom to worship it, actually now become him. You see, Daniel's three friends refused and the king had them thrown into the fire. And in the fire with them, the king saw one like a god. When they stepped out unscathed, the king again extolled the God of heaven. But in a huge misunderstanding of the ways of God, he threatened to tear limb from limb and destroy the houses of any who refused to acknowledge this God. And going back to the early allusion to his time as a beast in the field, he was indeed deprived of his reason after he, in typical pride, ascribed all his success to himself. But at the end of his insanity, he again recognized the God of heaven. All his works are right, and his ways are just, and those who walk in pride he is able to debase. There is no other ruler described in the Bible with a greater number of revelations and corrections from God. It is possible to read Daniel and have anything like the medieval concept of the divine right of kings. It is impossible after reading Daniel to think that God's people should ever obey laws that deny him just because authorities are bold enough to pass them. Yes, indeed, we are required to be exemplary citizens of a civil society, recognizing, as Paul pointed out in Romans chapter 13, that the civil authorities fill a void of authority that is legitimate and agreeable to God but any man, government, or king that asks us to compromise on our obligation to God is asking too much. And any authority that aspires to speak in the place of God has overstepped its bounds. And any civil power that imagines to use force to compel to even worship God has overstepped and shown it does not understand both its place and our God. There are many countries today that have severe laws restricting religious practice or compel to a particular religious viewpoint. We must pray for those faithful ones who live in such places. We should also pray that the authorities in those areas would be moved by God to restraint. And even in countries with present freedom, we should pray for it to continue and be on guard for improper application of the right to worship. It is a fact of history that even in the United States of America, a national Sunday law once looked likely to pass legislation. In 1888, a senator introduced a bill which had broad support in the religious community. One bold argument from religious liberty leaders like centennial editor Alonzo Jones stood in the way that and the restraining hand of the Lord who answered the prayers for relief. 
The law read in part, and I quote, a bill to secure to the people the enjoyment of the first day of the week, commonly known as the Lord's Day, as a day of rest, and to promote its observance, be it enacted by the Senate and House of Representatives of the United States of America in Congress assembled, that no person or corporation or the agent, servant, or employee of any person or corporation shall perform or authorize to be performed any secular work, labor, or business on the first day of the week, commonly known as the Lord's Day. That was correctly called a national Sunday law. Such an openly Sunday law might not pass today, but efforts continue, and the latest a Sunday family rest day recently advanced in the European Union with the full support of the major churches is showing up in the United States, most particularly in North Dakota, where spokespersons for one major church made bold statements that the intent is to promote Sunday sacredness. Times and seasons are still subject to change, it seems. After Nebuchadnezzar, his son Belshazzar ruled in Babylon. At a party for a thousand of his lords, the king sent for the sacred vessels looted from the temple in Jerusalem. This was more than a profane party joke. His father had respected other faiths and extolled the God of heaven. Now the son crossed the line between civil and religious power and imagined that he could use these vessels to extol other gods the gods of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. In other words, strange gods, idols fashioned from what men thought valuable. A supernatural hand wrote words of doom on the palace wall. It fell to Daniel, summoned at the word of the Queen Mother, to tell their meaning. Judgment was coming. The king was to pass to the, in the kingdom was to pass to the invading Medes and Persians. It's not hard to see a terrible parallel here to King of Saul of Israel years earlier. He had dared to offer the sacrifice on the altar, bypassing the role of the priest. For this, said the prophet Samuel, your kingdom is torn from you. Both in pagan Babylon and theocratic Israel, a civil ruler was presumed to mix the sacred and the profane, to directly assume the prerogatives of the priesthood incurred the wrath of God. As we remember and celebra celebrate Religious Liberty Day, let us be thankful that in the United States there is still respect for the First Amendment mandated that separation of church and state should be in existence. Let us pray always that our civil leaders will remember that the Lord Jesus Christ spoke of a kingdom not of this world. There is indeed a real separation between church and state that will become even more prominent in a time of testing. In a special testimony to the Battle Creek Church in 1882, Ellen White underscored the distinction that Jesus was leading to in his comment to Pilate. As we near the close of time, the demarcation between the children of light and the children of darkness will be more and more decided, she wrote. There will be more and more at variance. This difference is expressed in the words of Christ, born again, created anew in Christ, dead to the world and alive unto God. These are the walls of separation that divide the heavenly from the earthly and describe the difference between those who belong to the world and those who are chosen out of it, who are elect, precious in the sight of God. Thank you, Elder Wilson. It's uh, inspiring to hear again of the biblical example, not just of kings like Nebuchadnezzar, but heroes of faith like Daniel. As we enter this new phase of world history, a revolutionary era, I call it, all of us must be aware of the importance of religion and the importance of religious freedom. So many places around the world, we see that people's faith is restricted 
In so many places we see that a radical form of one type or another of religion is prepared to restrict the faith of others. It's worth remembering that those that study these things have pointed out recently that as many as 70% of the world's population are restricted in some important way in their practice of religion, often restricted in even changing their religious identity. I'd encourage all of you who are watching and listening to this program to uh, examine your support for religious liberty. This is an opportunity, certainly in North America, to not only pray for what we are doing, to pray for continued religious freedom in the practice of many people of faith throughout the world, but to give your means to enable the distribution of materials that speak about what, as Ellen White said in the sermon that uh, Elder Wilson uh, preached, the true wall of separation between the godly and the ungodly is a knowledge of Christ and a living of his life. That's what we are defending when we defend religious freedom. There is so much to do. There are so many people, leaders, from the President of the United States to uh, presidents and prime ministers in other countries, to the legislators, to the mayors, to, the, uh, to your neighbour, who need to hear that there is a, a meaning to what is happening today. This is like Nebuchadnezzar's dream for many people. The headlines are as confusing as that image was in, D in Nebuchadnezzar's midnight uh, dream. And not till we, as agents of the Lord, as agents like Daniel was to King Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon, not till we explain it to them, put it in a prophetic context, in the context of faith, will they know what this means? Because you and I, have been designated, charged by the Lord to be his emissaries, to be his proponents of this absolute religious freedom principle, the principle from on high.